Good afternoon, friends and colleagues, and welcome to this ERA symposium on green nephrology. This is presented on behalf of UDIAL or European Dialysis, our working, one of our working groups of ERA. There is no doubt that the health of our natural world is declining globally and at a rate that has been unprecedented in human history. This decline represents a major threat to the health and well being of human populations. And environmental changes, particularly climate change, is having and will continue to have an impact on the incidence and distribution of many chronic diseases, including kidney disease. The extremes and weather conditions owing to climate change will destabilize the effects on the provision of care for patients with kidney diseases. And ironically, the health uh, uh, the health care is part of this problem, contributing substantially to a depletion of resources, and particularly dialysis therapy is high up on the list of treatments that need a high amount of electricity, water, and consumables. So we need to address this issue, and of course we need to provide the best care for our patients, but not forgetting our environment. With this in mind, it is my great pleasure to, put, uh, to be a moderator at this symposium on green nephrology. My name is Rukshana Shroff. I'm a doctor in pediatric nephrology at Great Ormond Street in London. Today, our speaker is Georgina Piccoli. Professor Piccoli perhaps does not need an introduction in this symposium, but she's the chief of service at the Central Hospital of Le Mans in France and also holds an honorary position in the University of Torino, Italy. Georgina has many feathers in her hat. The one of the key ones is home hemodialysis, establishing this network and making it possible to carry out personalized dialysis treatments for our patients. Of course, this is important for the patient care, very importantly, but also very important. It helps with our environmental management as well. And Georgina will tell us a great deal more about this. Also on our panel today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vasilios Liakopoulos, an associate professor at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and also Massimo Torregiani, who has studied and worked in Pavia, Italy, and now works with Professor Piccoli in Le Mans, France. All three, all four of us here, in fact, are dialysis doctors. We are passionate about the treatment we give, but also we are very aware of how our treatment depletes resources. So without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Professor Piccoli to give us a talk on green nephrology. Professor Piccoli, welcome and thank you. For all our participants, don't forget to keep adding your questions in the Q&A box here. We will gladly go through these in the course of the meeting. So Georgina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me try to do the most difficult thing of all the talk that is sharing. You're halfway there. Well, just, yeah, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So each time we speak about green nephrology and ecodialysis, uh, some friends come and say, yes, you're a dreamer is a very nice thing, but it's just nice words. And indeed in the last years, we've heard a lot of nice, interesting talks, including the, the, the green talk of Pope Francis, uh, speaking about how we should change our attitude towards the world, the urgent challenge to protect our common home and the appreciation in particular for those who work for the poorest because pollution is not something, is something that might come from the rich but that affects the poor. And these impacts the whole society. These are problems linked to what has been called a throwaway society, a culture that reduces things to rubbish. Similar words have been heard from the Dalai Lama. It's not merely a moral question, it's a question of our own survival and not by chance. Uh, one of the recent Nobel Prize of the Economy uh, was about a wider project on climate challenge, but that is also on society. 
challenges. What's called the tragedy of commons, uh, that means the fact that we are not able to really share what we have. And uh, even philosophical societies speak about the circular economy and how to, to change these, that all these circles that all end in the same way, waste. But we're doctors, so why should it matter for us physicians? Well, when we start thinking about um, dialysis, the first thing that comes to the mind is waste management, then we go to prescription, to pre-dialysis care, to CKD prevention, and then to education interaction with the environment. Everything is linked, clinics to technology. We all have seen these circle reduce, reuse, recycle. And I will try to discuss what we can practically do, starting from reduce, that is something that we can do from a clinical point of view. Choosing when and how to start renal replacement therapy, using wisely nutritional management, physical activity, and perhaps also e-medicine. The challenge of reduce needs without reducing results is old. But this fantastic trial, the ideal trial, first made us change the way we were seeing things, uh, showing that it was not the healthy dialysis start did not work as well as we, we, we wished. And leading several societies, first of all, the Canadian one, to change completely the approach to dialysis with an intent to defer strategy where patients should be seen by the physicians and dialysis should not be start by numbers, but by saying, seeing the patient. Professor Van Older, who is the author of a beautiful review paper that is going to, to come out in the next few days on nephrology, dialysis and transplantation, spoke about the cost of renal replacement, replacement therapy a few years ago and underline how postponing start of dialysis was a wise way, but strangely or not strangely enough, five years ago, seven years ago, underline how green dialysis and dialysis based on clinical necessity were linked together. Dialysis is not a washing machine. The best program may not be the same for all, and some individuals may be better without dialysis or with a lower dose. And it's not by chance that the, the blog, the Australian blog on incremental dialysis is run by John Agar, who has been the inventor of the concept of green dialysis, ecodialysis. Incremental dialysis is just one step further. Uh, if we have to start late, why not also start gradually? And in this, that is now the only systematic review available. Indeed, what we see that this is less expensive, helps uh, uh, preserving residual kidney function, and it's for sure not deleterious on survival and maybe even the reverse. But if we move to precision medicine uh, and if we move, move to experience-based nuanced approaches, we can also discover another term that is decremental dialysis once more to try to adapt to patients' need. Massimo Torregiani ran this, this study uh, that we have done in Le Mans, uh, just very simply proposing to every patient without contraindication to start on an incremental way. And uh, while confirming that survival was at least the same, morbidity was slightly slow, lower, um, we shift the attention to the pre-dialysis phase. Having been followed up very strictly in the pre-dialysis phase um, increases by 10 times the probability of being able to start dialysis in an incremental way. So um, shifting the, 
the, uh, the attention to the pre-dialysis phase, let me uh, invite you reading this beautiful short commentary paper, holy cow, what's good for you is good for our planet because we know, we know well that cows have a very high carbon print and just avoiding eating them may lead us not only to have a better diet, a better elf, a better kidney elf, but to do something also for our planet. Reducing the carbon print can be done in many ways, rediscovering simple things like physical activity that is useful in all ways we see it also in reducing the burden of drugs that have in, in turn a high carbon print. It's, nothing is very easy. However, in, for example, in this nice small trial, we saw that about starting from 75 patients, only 10 patients finished a period of a few months of physical exercise. So doing natural things is not always very easy, but even uh, walking the dog, as um, Denis Fouk wrote a few years ago, may be sound for our patients and for the carbon print. Telemedicine. Well, in the COVID period, we have not seen our patients. We more in dialysis, but in pre-dialysis, it was sometimes difficult. We did not touch them. We sometimes were happy in seeing them uh, on, on a cell phone. Is this a good option to reduce the carbon print of healthcare? Probably yes, but we might do, uh, we might pay a lot of attention because it's too easy to, to put a label, it's ecological, it may also be depersonalizing and in the end, not a very good deal for the patients. So the clinics is important. The choice of a tailor-made dialysis start, nutritional therapy, physical therapy, a holistic and personalized approach have not only a clinical, but also an ecological meaning. Paying attention, of course, to cliche, pleonastic demonstration, and alibis to reduce the contact with patients. But green nephrology is a point of view. It's just a way we can see our work in a, under a different corner. I like this, this sentence, as a singer saying, I did not become a vegetarian for my elf. I did it for the elf of a of the chickens, there are some choices that we do not do for ourselves, we do them for the health of a planet. Let's go to technology. Technology, management, reuse, recycle, complete the three air and complete them by water conservation, energy conservation, waste management, and possibly it's not enough developed industrial design. Let me introduce John Agar, the genius who had first the idea of uh, green nephrology, starting from the care of his patients on home hemodialysis. And he started in Australia, where the weather is uh, a bit sunny, with water. Life starts with water. And uh, the water is the first example of what we can put in and out the vital cycle again. With very simple, uh, in very simple ways, uh, with very simple tools, he succeeded in recycling enormous quantity of water, just little homemade solution that helped uh, food grow, uh, kangaroos drink, I love this image. And indeed, in this wonderful review on green nephrology that um, appeared some time ago, on, two years ago, on Natural Review Nephrology, water is in the first line. Without going into, into details, uh, let me invite you reading this, this wonderful paper that shows that in many things, including almost housekeeping 
in, in our dialysis centers, we can make a difference. Much attention on osmosis um, recirculation, not only in this paper, but also in the experience of our colleagues, in particular from Morocco, another country where water is particular, particularly important. But even in places like Malaysia, where, where water is more abundant, there may be very interesting and poetic solutions like growing plants and well, maybe they are, they are eaten afterwards, so it's not so poetical, but uh, aquaponics. Um, before leaving the, um, the Fresenius company, Charles Chazot did something wonderful for su a sustainable nephrology. That is, he made the company change all the reverse osmosis, having the consumption of water drop down for the same number of dialysis sessions. There are many things we can do. Some wonder if we should lower the dialysis, um, the, the dialysis flow. Uh, some suggest, even Claudio Ronco, who is a passionate of very intensive dialysis, uh, how we can make water sparing prescriptions. On a very small scale, when we reduced from eight milliliters per minute to 500 milliliters per minute, uh, the, the speed of a dialysis flow in our center, well, we, we, we could um, fill a few swimming pools. Many say that peritoneal dialysis may be a choice uh, because it uses far less dialysate. There is just one small thing. We do not know how much water consumes the water we have in the dialysis solution and the industry is very opaque about that. And we know that plastic consumes water. So if we put everything together, well, we may gain something, but it's not so clear. Energy sparing comes with water sparing. And once again, John Agar is the, the pioneer of solar assisted hemodialysis centers. We were discussing yesterday with the Italian group for green nephrology on the possibility of making a statement on the ideal dialysis center using, among other things, solar assistance. And even John Agar again tried to calculate how much with or without solar energy could be the carbon print of a day of things that are considered. Uh, it's a pity that uh, the few other studies that worked on trying to, to quantify the carbon footprint used different items. And indeed, this is one of the limitation of the use of carbon print as a global env env environmental marker. We should probably be a little bit more humble and start from smaller things. And once again, uh, Jonaga reminds us that we do not know anything about the carbon print of peritoneal dialysis. Water and energy are, are much linked and the winter two years ago of the affordable dialysis price indeed um, suggested that we can produce with solar power uh, pure water for any source, thus facilitating dialysis all over the world. Dialysis is uh, an enormous machine, waste machine, I would say, and waste management is very important in, in this sense, but uh, it's, a, it's an important issue shared by virtually all aspects of medicine. The amount of plastic waste that is produced per dialysis session can range from 1.5 to almost eight kilograms, depending upon the type of dialysis, the type of supplies, and also differentiation and emptying procedure. Um, 
green dialysis is not just cost, but the cost of waste disposal is very high. And sometimes we fight for having a reduction of one euro for the dialysis, the new dialysis supplies when we may waste up to 16 just for discharging. What's left? What's left? All this is plastic. But only a very small part of this is potentially recyclable. Less than 30%, but because the use of different types of plastic, glues, inks, labels, prevents being recycled. But actually, it is not done. Well, this is a nice way of finding a reuse. Once more, is poetical, but is just down use. We could probably also rethink some taboos like reuse on hemodialysis. Hector Perez Grobas, who is a great nephrologist from Mexico City, used wise recycling of filters to reusing of filters to allow his patients um, uh, be treated by hemodiafiltration, whose material was, is much more expensive in his country. And even if nothing is done, why not thinking again about all the solution? Waste management is a good starting point, but less be bad is not good. Reuse prolongs the life of the options, but does not change the cycle, take, make, waste. This book is a fantastic book. Even a physician like me could understand it, so it's probably too simple. But um, it's, the, it's the book of the so-called cradle-to-cradle revolution, rethinking the way we made things, trying to, to learn from nature. Plants synthesize nutrients, feed cows. These become food for us. We produce organic waste and so forth. So why don't we try to imagine similar cycles for all what we produce instead of throwing it away, putting it back into the same cycle? Waste equal food. Everything can be a, a nutrient for something else. We should define the content. We should restudy materials and we should use them again and again and again. To do so, there is a long list of things that we should ask ourselves. And when we look at a dialysis machine, well, let's think about it. These are done to be used sometime, occasionally reused, often when worn up in rich countries that have a fixed maximum time, they may migrate to poor countries and then discharge so that we do not even have to care about that. No part of this machine is done for being disassembled and to return it back to the vital cycle of objects. And what will happen of this? This is highly toxic among all. And it's what is called we. We is like a cry from nature because these electrical and electronic waste are becoming the fastest growing waste generated and is now about 15% of all waste. What if dialysis machines were done like this chair, this one of the first object in the cradle to cradle uh, production easily reduced in more small parts, recyclable and able to become a new object again and again. A few years ago, we started and then I, I moved, but it's one of my hopes to restart again, a uh, disassemble project with a Turin University, trying to disassemble a dialysis machine to imagine a better way to rebuild it, to make the story of a chair true for the dialysis machine too. It's feasible. We just have to have enough uh, links and enough wish to do it. Uh, two years ago, the Italian Society of Nephrology did uh, a statement on green nephrology and ecodialysis. There is a list of things to do, reduce the burden of dialysis, limit, limiting drugs, favoring natural medicine, 
encouraging the use of household materials, recycling paper and glass, recycling non-contaminated plastic, reducing water consumption, energy consumption, and so on, demanding also planet-friendly approaches in the building of new facilities. Um, there is nothing to add for what is uh, the air, except adding repairing dialysis machine. What's a little bit new in this position statement is to put the clinical themes in the core of a question. So in summary, in our hopes, in our dreams, as physician, we may, we should reduce and reinvest. We may reduce dialysis need to reinvest for those who need it. We may reduce garbage wisely managing it. We may project new design that allow re reducing plastic waste by cutting so much of blood lines make kilometers of plastic less. We need a different partnership with the industry if we want to change also their marketing strategy, color labels for a way approach, durable is good instead of new is good, plant friendly instead of nurse friendly, plastic sparing instead of time sparing, redesign simple objects like the dialysis kits, the bloodlines, more compact machines. We may reuse supplies in special situation, but we should overall remain open-minded towards new and old taboos. Why no research on safe and wise reuse Water should always be recycled, solar power always considered, and potential for recycling should be considered. We cannot do everything by ourselves, but let's start asking the industry and putting these in, in our decisions. And we have to support redesign. We know what we want. So if we want to have a biosphere compatibility and not only biocompatibility, it's our time to try to find partnership. No, nothing with, will happen by itself. Uh, and let me finish with some hope. Uh, too much to do? No, be kind with the planet whenever possible. It's always possible. And it always seems impossible until it's done. Let's hope to be able to say this in a few years from now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Georgina. That was a superb overview on green nephrology. There is so much we can do and so much we all need to do really in this process. That's a fantastic overview. Um, may I now, may I welcome all our, all our participants to send us questions. Please insert them in the Q&A box and we will look forward to a discussion very soon on your questions. Meanwhile, uh, we have a little bit of time. So Massimo, would you like to give us your presentation, please? Um, oh, in the next few minutes. Okay, so Dr. Piccoli has already said uh, a lot of things. Uh, I would like just to add something to stimulate the discussion. Uh, one of the, as Georgina said, uh, one of the points that is always raised in order to spare water in the dialysis units, unit is to reduce the dialysate flow. Uh, we know that uh, the, the impact of raising the dialysis flow on the depuration is not that much. And so now most of the, of the patient dialyze with a dialysis flow of 500 ml per minute. So the question is, can we reduce the dialysis flow, let's say to 400 ml per minute? This would save 3,744 liters per year per patient. So if we imagine all the patients on dialysis, these uh, can fill more than uh, a few pools. But uh, what we do not know exactly is what happens to the depuration. And uh, if we take a look uh, at uh, the technical sheets of dialysis uh, membranes, actually, uh, all the clearances are usually expressed uh, for different blood flows, but just one dialysate flow, which is 500 ml per minute. So 
no one really knows what happens uh, in a real life situation. And another thing is that uh, most of the times, uh, another possibility that is um, raised is that we can use uh, medium cutoff membranes to obtain the same results uh, than convective te techniques. Why? Because uh, in the studies that, uh, let's say, um, approved the medium cutoff membranes uh, for uh, clinical use, uh, there was no difference in terms of depuration um, for small, medium, and large molecules. The problem is that most of these studies were done uh, taking a look at the reduction ratios. So the patient side of the problem. And uh, I think that uh, one opportunity that we have now is that we have uh, the means uh, to quantify directly the mass transfer in vivo during a real life dialysis session with instruments like these, uh, samplers that take only a small percentage of all the dialysate that flows through the machine during a dialysis session and allow us to quantify the mass transfer, what is lost during a dialysis session. And uh, I would like to give you just uh, um, to present you some um, personal and unpublished and confidential data that we produced in Le Mans. Uh, here you can see a table showing nine consecutive dialysis sessions of a single patient, always uh, on the same technique and HDF post dilution with the same membrane. And you can see that uh, uh, from one session to another, even if the conditions of the dialysis and the patients did not change, there is a great variability about what is lost in the dialysis. So if uh, under the optimal conditions, let's say 300 uh, ml per minute of blood flow and 500 ml per minute of dialysate flow, we have such a great variability. Are we sure that uh, uh, reducing the dialysate flow will change a lot to the patient? I'm not sure. It, we, should, uh, we should make some... Um, uh, some studies about that, uh, but let me also remind uh, the ecological impact of reducing the intensive farming of uh, cattle. But I think there are some ethical issues that, um, uh, let's say, make uh, the, the transition towards an ecodialysis harder, ethical issues. For instance, when we, when we talk about reducing the dialysis flow, but we don't really know what is the effect on the patients, are we allowed to do that? I think that uh, we need to reflect on that to overcome these obstacles. And I think that uh, physicians alone can do a lot but not everything. And we need the collaborators of the patients, first of all, because patients are interested in the, in the future of the planet, in uh, reducing waste, uh, reducing the carbon footprint and the energy uh, demands of uh, our activities. Engineers, of course, uh, in order to uh, implement that cradle to cradle um, cycle uh, that uh, was mentioned by Dr. Pictocoli, the, in, the industry also, because uh, the problem now is that uh, there are no clear economic benefits. Uh, and so industry is not uh, listening to the, really to the, um, to the needs of our uh, planet or the, the ecodialysis. Scientific societies too should uh, push a little pressure on governments in order to facilitate the transition. That are just a few hints for the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, that was a very good overview as well. So now let us open up our discussions for a group discussion and a, a roundtable discussion between us. Um, Again, I'd like to welcome the audience to send through some questions. And while you do that as an audience, may I ask um, yourselves, Georgina, Massimo, and Vasilios, two questions. One is if I am establishing a new dialysis unit in a new hospital that's being built, um, what suggestions would you give for me? A second question is, if I have an established dialysis unit where I can't change the structure of my building, what would you advise for me? And the third question is, if you were from industry, PD or hemodialysis, and the advisor to industry, what would you advise them to change as our demands as physicians and as people who care for the planet? So three questions, three of you. Georgina, I will give you the first pick. Which one would you like to answer? Well, let me say something about the new dialysis unit. Uh, I think that, that there is a very, a very simple um, answer. We have to, to, to push our direction to find an intelligent architect that has experience on um, ecological uh, buildings. It's something that should be demanded structurally, uh, as well as one should demand that our hospitals give us zero kilometer food instead of uh, horrible things in plastic um, wraps. Uh, it, it's a part of the discussion that we should do with our directions. Um, it's very difficult to give one solution for all because of course the solutions that we can have in the more sunny Italy may not be the, the as good as or the same that we can have in Sweden for example. But I think that uh, what's sadly happening now the war will finally push us reconsidering how much energy we waste and often how much energy we waste in public settings. Um, so um, I, I think it's time that we ask for being involved in the discussion and for involving experts in the discussion. Uh, I think it's something that could be done also at the European EDTA level in the sense that it could be interesting to, in which each uh, of us who has some colleagues, uh, some, some, sometimes some friends working on these issues, uh, shares experiences to try to, to, to go more in this direction. I think it's, it's probably easier to push the industry because usually when, when you have the new centers, here are the keys, there is a capitulate that is previously done and it should be demanded that as much as possible the center is equipped with renewable energy uh, solar power and so on uh, it's as massimo says it's something where we can make culture we can make it not make it directly uh, but uh, but it has to be done and uh, last thing that I, I discussed, I'm living in, a, uh, in France, they built the new center and it's one of the things that I insisted, uh, tell us, uh, tell us about the energy, tell us about these, tell us, no one ever asked that. So we have to start asking and then someone will start answering, not immediately, they got mad at me. But then endly they, they started answering. Exactly, absolutely. Thank you very much. And that is exactly the perseverance and the determination we need to bring about change. As you say, Georgina, it's a change in mindset, which is the first step before actions are taken. Uh, maybe Vasilios, I can ask you if I have a, an established dialysis unit, but I cannot change the structure of it. What suggestions do you have for implementing greener solutions? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, well, that, that's a tough question because if you start from the beginning, if you start from scrap, then, then you can make everything. Uh, but I think that, uh, for example, one idea would be to, to change the reverse osmosis to a more efficient one, more water saving or more energy saving. That should be, I think, uh, the, one of the main, the, the main goals that uh, a dialysis provider uh, should have. Uh, of course, again, for example, if the, if the dialysis unit is in a separate building, then solar energy on the rooftop and everything could, could, be, uh, could be a solution, could, could be uh, an alternative. Uh, but there are also, uh, I think, um, ways that healthcare staff could use, for example, uh, uh, to, 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 to differentiate from the hazardous, from the non-hazardous, the recyclables from the non-recyclables, uh, so that some kind of recycling could, can be done. Uh, and of course, hazardous waste always should always be uh, at the site and uh, alone. Uh, the, there's, I think that this green culture should be implemented in all the dialysis staff and the patients and the patients. And for example, let, uh, I, I really liked the idea of um, exercise, exercise and diet. This is something that at first you cannot think that this may have a very big impact, environmental impact, but it's not so. So Professor Piccoli just showed us and persuaded us that it is a, it is a very important aspect. Uh, convincing our patients to exercise, we don't need to have a new uh, dialysis facility, that, that's understandable. Or diet, if uh, they have a better diet, for example, with less uh, phosphate rich, then they, they need less medication, uh, less containers, and etc. And maybe if uh, a dialysis provider could choose, uh, uh, for example, containers that are uh, chlorine free, if there are available, uh, th this should be uh, should reduce the, the environmental burden. Eh? You know, excellent. Yes, absolutely. PVC and chlorine have a very bad impact on the environment. Thank you very much. And Massimo, uh, perhaps the most difficult question, uh, as industry with PD and HEMO, and of course, home HEMO, what would you tell and demand from industry that they to help us change? First of all, I would try to reverse the situation and uh, ask ourselves, uh, what can we do to push industry to do something? And I think we should act on the economic leverage. So if we are able as physicians to produce um, studies that show that is, uh, there is a convenience in changing the way of production, industry will follow, I think. So that's what we can do. I think we cannot expect an engagement uh, uh, by the industry, if uh, because industry are are not not profit organizations, of course, so uh, we should um, we should give them the the evidences that the transition is feasible and uh, is uh, convenient. And uh, if I may add a comment on the previous question, I think that the key what we can do in an established and in a in an already established dialysis facility is to think at the dialysis facility as our own home. In order to save what we do, we all do, we turn off the lights, we turn off the computers when we, when we finish uh, using them when we, or when we go to bed. Don't, so the little actions that everyone can do is, uh, are a, a feasible option. And uh, as it is written in the review from uh, John Agar that appeared two years ago on um, Nature Reviews Nephrology, even charging someone on the personnel for who is interested in the green 
dialysis in the green, nephro in green nephrology uh, would have an impact because uh, it will uh, share the, um, um, the behavior. Indeed, thank you very much for that summary. Excellent. We have two questions coming through on our chat. Um, Vasilios and Massimo, do you want to start going through these questions perhaps? Uh, yes, I can uh, comment about incremental dialysis. I'm uh, a fan of uh, incremental dialysis. So I think it is uh, a good way to postpone the start of dialysis and save resources. Uh, moreover, if uh, we manage the patient with uh, a low protein diet, maybe a vegan vegetarian diet, we can uh, even add something more to the delay of dialysis in terms of ecologic impact. And uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, not doing something is the best way to save resources. <laughs> so. Thank you. Vasilios, would you yes. like to take the next question? The next question I think is about the reuse of dialyzers, yes. Well, I, I don't know, maybe uh, Professor Piccoli could, could correct me, but I think that there is no study on environmental impact of single use versus reuse of dialyzers because you need disinfectants, you need a, lo a lot of, uh, and you produce a lot of liquid waste. So I'm not sure that will be environmentally more effective. And there are some issues, some questions regarding safety and maybe even cost. Uh, at least uh, in the last years, uh, the cost of dialyzers is, re is reduced, I, I think, at least in Greece. So I don't know this would be very cost effective and I, I'm not aware of uh, any studies regarding the environment, I don't know. If I can add something, indeed, I think it's a, um, I put it in a way to, to open the discussion because of course everything changed, but changed because of um, of the fact that it was the choice of shifting from uh, multiple use to single use was merely economical, and reuse has still been done in some settings like Mexico, where manpower is much less costly. So. Um, the point is that since it's something that was considered obsolete, and since we are the throwaway society, there was no new solution on reuse. The way reuse has been done and is still done in some niche uh, all over the world, better reused than nothing, is toxic, um, is not safe, is unsure, one does not really know how is the advantage? But there is no, no, even no study on the reuse as it was done, but are we sure it's the only way? Reuse was, was done when uh, ethylene oxide was the standard, for example. Now we have different means, we have completely different membranes. There is something that should be studied instead of studying a slightly different pore in which uh, albumin gets trapped, we might also uh, try to study how we can do something more physiological. There are ways we're moving in a way in medicine towards um, the sort of biomimetics uh, approaches and we're using plastic uh, for dialysis. There is nothing new in the approach to use and reuse. And even just changing the way the, the, the shells are done to make them really reusable uh, would change a lot. There are, I mean, there are many things that can be done, but there is zero study. And of course, when I say we should rethink reuse, we should think reuse 2022. Not in 2022, the reuse when I started studying medicine long time ago. 
Indeed, absolutely right. And uh, Georgina, in, in addition to everything you've said, there's a good question here about returning and reusing the dialysate canisters for refilling and increasing the concentrate, reducing volume delivered, etc. So another very good point from one of our attendees in the meeting. Um, that was very interesting indeed. Thank you. Can I ask, um, uh, Actually, here, there's a very good question that's come up now. It says dialyzers are reused by us to produce potable water in Africa. That is an interesting point. And in fact, uh, Dr. Schneinitz, may I invite you to actually join us live and speak at this uh, speak up um, to give your point of view? In the meanwhile, while he tries to connect, uh, can mm -hmm. I add something on the previous question? What should we ask to the industry a very simple thing to include the technical sheet or of their material the ecological impact of what they Correct. That could be a little step forward correct indeed and as georgina also said you know we don't know what the 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 cost of pd is in terms of the cost to the environment and the, all these things need to be accountable and published published with the with the material we get absolutely worse than that several industry industries refused telling this to janaga mm -hmm. already refusing yes. saying something telling something to janaga is not easy they refused answering so this is unacceptable. In that, Georgina, one quick question for you. You gave us an extremely important point about water conservation and how crucial water conservation is. And including the study by, by Fresenius to, uh, to uh, reuse water. Could you tell us a little bit more about it, please? Well, uh, there are, um, you know, the, the, the big point uh, is that um, the water we use, the 400 milliliters per minute or 800 milliliters per minute, comes from a larger amount of water that is not always quantified. The old generation of uh, biosmosis used up to um, three times more water for production. Now it's one and a half. Uh, because there is a way in which a part of this waste water comes again into the circuit and is recycled again. So uh, there are several technical uh, choices that uh, roughly saying it as a human being, uh, uh, because it's, I'm not uh, an engineer, the point is most of the reduced the, the water can be reduced and circulate more times but even the water that is discharged that is quite salty is less salty than many mineral waters we drink and uh, john agar made an experiment uh, having people from because it's forbidden to reuse it in some places and so he invited um, some politicians to drink the, the different waters and to say which was the good one and no one was able to, to, to make the difference. So there is a point in which probably uh, re recirculating impacts on the lifetime of the membranes that are very expensive and whose production is also as also a carbon print, a cost in energy and everything. Uh, but at that time, uh, that comes differently. Uh, the, the water could be reused for gardening, for sterilization, for washing, mm -hmm. and for more poetical things like uh, feeding kangaroos and aquaponics. Indeed. Thank you very much, Georgina. Uh, Daniel, uh, Dr. Schneditz, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, no. but welcome and thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing your point of view. There are two points. One point is the incremental dialysis, which maybe was misunderstood, to prescribe the dialysis according to the residual renal function. That is the point. So there is no need to have three times a week dialysis in year, uh, 
all the time because the renal residual renal function sometimes picks up again and you can reduce the frequency and this is not i mean this is i know this is investigated by certain people but this is not uh, common or popular view at the moment because everything is done in a standard in a in a standard th three treatments per weekly schedule and so on that's the one, that's one point the other point is that the reuse of dialyzers when i worked in the united states when in some units dialyzers were reused for more than i don't know 60 times this saved a lot of money to the to the institutions and i know they used chemicals at that time but then they moved to less dangerous chemicals for sterilis for for cleaning of dialysis like citric acid and so on so i think this could be resolved and i wanted to mention that dr levine with whom i worked in new york he developed a program in africa reusing dialysis to um, to produce potable water for areas where you cannot where the water is contaminated by by organic waste and mud and so on, particulate matter, so you cannot drink it. It cannot be cleaned from chemicals, so if it is, if, it, if the water contains poisonous material, but it can be cleaned to remove bacteria and all the, that stuff. This can be done with, with reusing dialysis. So there are many ways to reuse equipment. Um, and maybe one comment to, to, to Massimo, uh, Torre Johnny about reducing the dialysate flow. The reduction of dialysate flow will, can, the reduction of clearance can exactly be predicted by formulas how much this will reduce the, the, the removal of, of, of solutes. And it will, of course, reduce some, but it may not, it may be worthwhile reducing the flow. So I agree with that. Thank you. That's my, these are my points. Thank you very Many much. <laughs> that was very yeah. interesting. Thank you so much. So we have just two minutes left and it is time to wrap up. Uh, I think it was a really interesting session. Um, so much more we all of us can do to improve the health of our planet. And it's truly an existential issue. So we need to move away and from our small day-to-day -day problems to the global problem of our world and do something more there. Um, I'd like to thank all of our participants, Georgina for a fabulous talk, Massimo and Vasilios, thank you very much for very interesting discussions and the ERADTA team for helping us through this. For all our participants, you have the live participants will earn one European credit for their CME, Continuous Medical Education, and this is an exclusive benefit for ERA members. So if you're not a member, please become one. The next working group e-seminar is going to be on the 10th of May 2022. This is organized by the CKD MBD working group, and this is an update on biomarkers for CKD MBD. So with this, thank you all very much indeed for speaking, for participating, and for your enthusiasm enthusiasm for this very important topic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.